Uh, hello and welcome to the 10th Digital Europe Economic Seminar. Uh, today we have a presentation by Dr. Marianne Nadim and Alden Fladmo. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, sorry if, if, if not. Um, of the uh, Institute for Social Research in Oslo. Uh, Dr. Nadim holds a PhD in sociology from University of Oslo. She is the edit editor of the Norwegian Journal of Social Research and was a member of the Norwegian National UNESCO Commission and the Norwegian Government's Equality Commission. Her research focuses on gender equality, immigrant integration, and freedom of speech. Uh, Dr. Fladmo holds a PhD in political science from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. He is a senior research fellow at the Institute for Social Research and has previously worked at TNS Gallup and was a research fellow at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Uh, his research focuses, among others, on political polarization, trust, and inequality. Uh, we have approximately 40 minutes reserved for the presentation and followed by time for questions. But if you need any clarification along the way, uh, do feel free uh, to ask. Uh, so Dr. Nadim and Dr. Fadl, thank you very much for agreeing to be here. And the floor is yours. Well, yeah, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, so let's just uh, see if we can share our presentation. We can have it then. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so um, we thought that we would present our research on online hate and har harassment and its gendered uh, dimensions. And mostly, oh no, this is not working, okay. There. So uh, most of what we're gonna say is based on this paper, which uh, has been published in Social Science Computer Review. Uh, and our uh, point of departure is a growing attention to gender-based online harassment both in the research literature, but also in the public debate. Um, and at least here in Norway, we've had numerous reported examples um, that leave a clear impression that women are particularly vulnerable to fall victim of online harassment. Uh, however, uh, there is a lack of empirical studies examining gender differences in experiences with online harassment in the population as a whole. Uh, basically, we don't know that much about how this plays out among ordinary internet workers, uh, sorry, internet users. So this is what we wanted to study. Um, so our research questions were, or we, yeah, as Audun will come back to, we, we draw on two large uh, scale population surveys in Norway and, and try to examine the gendered nature of online um, harassment. And our research questions are, first, um, do women experience more and different online harassment than men? And second, uh, to what extent are there gendered patterns in how online harassment works as a silencing mechanism? And I'll come back to what uh, silencing, what we mean when we say silencing mechanism. Basically, uh, what it entails is uh, to what extent online harassment makes people more cautious in expressing their uh, views. Uh, so as mentioned, there are a few empirical studies uh, examining the gender differences in experiences with online harassment. Uh, and the ones that we have found paint a very mixed picture. Basically, the conclusions of previous research uh, depend on the methodology used in the different studies. Uh, studies of online content, where they've done content analysis of yeah, different types of, uh, of content on the internet, they tend to conclude that um, there is substantially more online hatred and online harassment directed towards women than there is towards men. Uh, Population-based surveys uh, that, um, that examine the actual experiences of women and men online are more inconclusive. Um, some studies find that women are disproportionately affected by gender-based and sexualized online uh, harassment, whereas others find only small gender differences. 
Uh, however, there seems to be a consistent finding that men and women experience different types of online harassment and hate. So uh, I just thought I'd mention some short keywords uh, on our theoretical perspectives um, on group-based harassment. Um, and, I and we call it group-based harassment because we're interested in, or because this is about harassment that attacks you not only as an individual, but also as a member of a group. For instance, as a member of the gendered group uh, women. So uh, in the literature on hate speech, uh, there is a strong, or the literature here uh, suggests that group-based harassment has wider consequences and hurts more uh, than other forms of harassment as it attacks a person's core identity or core difference. Um, and since hate speech triggers the awareness of belonging to a vulnerable group, it can incite more fear than other types of degrading speech. So basically uh, a conclusion in this literature is that when you, it's not the same to be attacked as an individual as it is to be attacked for who you are as a member of a perhaps vulnerable and stigmatized group, for instance, uh, because of your gender or because of your ethnic minority status. Uh, furthermore, uh, in this literature, uh, they see group-based harassment or, or hate speech um, as message crimes. This means that intentionally or not, uh, this type of harassment targets not only the direct victim uh, of harassment, but also the wider community sharing the same identity traits. So it's not only the di direct receiver of harassment who is affected, but also others belonging to the same group. So for women, uh, perceptions of other women's experiences and uh, consequently the knowledge about, you know, the risk of being subjected to the same type of harassment oneself, this can incite fear, even if they themselves have had no uh, personal experiences with harassment or hate speech. So this, uh, this is why the literature on online harassment and hate speech makes this clear distinction between group-based harassment, targeting, for, uh, targeting someone uh, for who they are and their uh, kind of group memberships and other types of harassment. Um, and and, uh, and the like, clear assumption in this literature is that group-based harassment has wider consequences and and more adverse uh, consequences. Um, and I mentioned that we're interested in, in the silencing effect. And we see that studies uh, have shown that experiences with online harassment, in addition to inciting fear and other uh, emotional symptoms, it can also lead individuals to become more cautious in expressing their views. And this is what we mean by a silencing effect. So this is what, uh, some, also something that we wanted to study. And so Alvin will uh, take over and say something more about the empirical strategy and our results. Yes, so we use the term online harassment as an overarching concept that covers a range of behaviors from less severe utterances, such as unpleasant comments, to more severe forms of hate speech and threats. Uh, so analytically, we distinguish uh, instances of online harassment along two dimensions. First, uh, uh, the level of aggressiveness in the tone or style of the comment. And second, what the comments, uh, comment targets. Uh, uh, as Marjan, Marjan mentioned, uh, we are uh, particularly interested in group-based harassment, what we uh, uh, popularize as who you are versus what you think. So if the harassment targets who you are, it's, uh, the, the hypothesis is that that's more severe than um, harassment targeting what you think. Uh, so the first dimension uh, captures uh, that online harassment can range from name calling, insults and comments the receiver perceives as unpleasant to more severe behavior in the form of hateful comments and threats, uh, which might even be unlawful. 
Um, yeah, and the second dimension concerns the content of the comment and specifically what the comment attacks or the grounds the message is directed towards. Uh, so when studying uh, gender differences in uh, exposure to online harassment, one may think of several confounding factors uh, explaining gender differences. Uh, so in, in, in addition to standard sociodemographics, uh, we control for uh, political ideology and online behavior. Um, concerning political ideology, people holding political views that deviate from mainstream politics may be more exposed to online harassment. And studies suggest that men are overrepresented in extreme political groups, and they also, to a larger extent than women, vote for populist right-wing parties. Thus, they are more often than women, they more often than women hold opinions transgressing mainstream politics. And second, um, gender differences may also be attributed to online behavior. Studies suggest that men engage in more risky uh, be, uh, behavior online, and this might make them more exposed to online harassment. So we postulate two hypotheses. Uh, um, the first one, although previous research provides a mixed picture as to whether women receive more online harassment than men, we would expect women and men uh, to receive different types of online harassment. And the second hypothesis points to, uh, 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 or, or we expect that more uh, severe harassment affects the recipients more than less severe harassment. And uh, furthermore, that we expect uh, that messages targeting who people are uh, in terms of group belonging uh, or as individuals have wider consequences than online harassment directed towards one attitudes or arguments. So in the study, we, uh, we rely on two, two separate uh, population-based surveys carried out by means of web questionnaire in 2013 and 2016. Uh, the samples were drawn from pre uh, from pre recruited web panels. In both surveys, people with uh, higher education are overrepresented, while young adults and people of immigrant background are underrepresented. So, in the analysis, we control for these factors. But one uh, possible uh, implication or uh, limitation of the of the study is that since we have few respondents with uh, immigrant background. Um, the data probably and the report online harassment directed towards immigrant related attributes such as ethnicity, skin color, uh, or nationality. And it is also important to emphasize that uh, when we are relying on survey data, we measure subjective uh, assessments of online harassment. This is not an uh, objective uh, study of, of, uh, um, of, uh, of actual uh, harassment. Um, so different respondents may have different conceptions of what constitutes harassment, and they may uh, interpret the same utterances differently. Uh, so the first dependent variable uh, received online harassment, uh, we distinguish between, or we try to distinguish between the two dimensions I mentioned. Uh, first, the level of aggressiveness of the comment, uh, where, the, where the survey from 2013 uh, measures uh, experiences with unpleasant or patronizing comments, and the study in 2016 uh, measures uh, experiences with hate speech or hateful messages. So in a, in a Norwegian context, uh, hate speech is uh, much more aggressive or perceived as much more aggressive than unple unpleasant and patronizing uh, comments. Uh, in both surveys, uh, we can distinguish between messages directed towards different characteristics. Those who responded that they had received online harassment were followed up with a question of what grounds these messages were most often directed towards. So it was possible to select one or more attributes from a long list, which we have grouped into three categories. Um, uh, group characteristics, uh, which includes, uh, includes gender, ethnicity, nationality, skin color, 
religion, uh, uh, disability, or uh, sexual orientation, uh, individual characteristics, which includes uh, uh, personality and appearance, and finally, attitudes, uh, harassment directed towards uh, people's attitudes or arguments, uh, which include political views and content or arguments, which is farther away from uh, uh, a more conventional uh, conception of uh, hate speech. The second dependent variable is cautiousness in expressing opinions publicly. So uh, all respondents who said that they had uh, been um, victims of uh, some kind of online harassment uh, received uh, this question after experiencing either unpleasant or patronizing comments or hate speech. Have you become more cautious in expressing opinions publicly? So the analytical strategy of the paper was to systematically compare women's and men's experiences of and reactions to online harassment. And this was done by estimating predicted means from logistic regression models with control variables set to mean value. So I'll show you some of the results. Uh, this is the these are the descriptive statistics. So this table displays all the variables used in the analysis. Um, the main takeaway, I think, from this uh, table or the first glimpse into the results is that we uh, this, it it's, it obviously seems that uh, hateful comments is a more is a more aggressive form of speech than unpleasant comments. Six percent said they have received hateful comments. 17% said they had received um, unpleasant comments. They say they can just pick up. Oh, okay. um, <clears throat> and among those who had received hateful comments, 29% said they had been cautious in expressing opinions publicly, while 9% of those who had uh, been targets of unpleasant comments said the same. So this table shows the predicted share of men and women who have been targets of online harassment and what these messages were directed towards, controlling for age, education, and immigrant background. And perhaps surprisingly, at least us, uh, uh, the table suggests that overall, men are more likely than women to report uh, being targets of online harassment in both services. So it's independent of the question wording, uh, or um, or survey year. Um, the table further shows that uh, the main reason why men are more likely to be targets of online harassment than women is because they are more likely to receive harassment directed towards uh, political attitudes uh, or arguments, as you see um, almost at the end of the um, table. Um, uh, and also individual characteristics when it comes to unpleasant comments targeting their personality. Considering group characteristics, uh, which is closer to conventional definitions of hate speech, there are overall no gender differences in prevalence. Of the different uh, group attributes, however, uh, women are more likely to be targets of harassment directed towards their gender, while men are more likely to be targets of harassment directed towards their ethnicity, nationality, or skin color. So the next step was to, uh, to study the gender differences when taking uh, political uh, ideology and online behavior into, into account. So these, I'll show you two figures which are summaries of this, uh, of this, uh, of this analysis. Um, so this figure shows the gender differences uh, when we control for ideology and internet behavior. So if the bars go up, more women uh, experience these uh, uh, different kinds of online harassment. And if the bars go down, more men experience online harassment. So there, overall, the results suggest that introducing political ideology as a control variable has limited of effect compared to only controlling for socio-demographics. 
However, controlling for online behavior, we see that the gender uh, differences are reduced uh, most profoundly when it comes to online harassment directed towards attitudes uh, or arguments. And a similar but smaller uh, reduction is observed uh, concerning harassment directed towards individual characteristics. So does these, these results suggest that part of, but not the whole explanation, why more men than women uh, have received online harassment is that men are more likely to expose themselves online by sharing their opinions publicly. So this figure uh, summarizes the second uh, analysis of the paper, uh, the reactions. Um, so, so these are the same, the same, the same illustration, but the dependent variable is uh, cautiousness and expressing, expressing opinions publicly after being exposed to online harassment. Uh, so it is important to note that the number of observations is limited since these analyses are based only on those who had experienced online harassment. Nevertheless, the results suggest relatively clear uh, gender differences. Women have a much stronger tendency than men to become more cautious in expressing their opinions publicly. And furthermore, the results suggest that the tone and the target of the messages seem to matter. The gender differences are largest among those who have been targets of hate speech compared to those uh, who have been targets of unpleasant comments. Uh, and the gender differences are larger if the harassment targets group uh, characteristics or individual characteristics also in, uh, when measuring hate speech compared to uh, online harassment targeting attitudes or arguments. So in um, uh, one illustration is that ab about 20, there are about 25%. The share of women saying that they have been uh, more cautious is about 25% higher than the share of men saying that they have been more cautious if they have received hate speech targeting group or individual characteristics. So the implication of these findings is that the differences in how women and men are affected by online harassment are largest when the tone or style of the messages is most aggressive and when the messages are directed towards group or individual characteristics, in other words, targeting who they are. So women uh, react more strongly uh, if targeted by online harassment, harassment, harassment at who they are uh, than uh, if, uh, if it targets uh, um, the, uh, what, they, what, they, uh, what they mean. Okay, so uh, this was the, these were the main findings um, from this study. Um, and so, Perhaps contrary to popular belief, we actually then find that in the general population, women are not more likely uh, than men to experience online harassment. Um, men are more likely than women to have experienced both or to report to have experienced both uh, unpleasant comments and hateful comments. Uh, so why is this? Just to sum up uh, the results. Um, so the main reason, as Aldun also showed, why men receive more online harassment than women is that they uh, receive more messages uh, directed towards what they think, i.e. more often than women report that they have received unpleasant or hateful comments directed towards their arguments or political attitudes. If we only consider group-based online harassment, and that's, uh, that means circling in on what is conventionally considered as hate speech, the gender differences disappear. Uh, furthermore, uh, we saw that women are more exposed to online harassment directed towards gender than men. Now, uh, this data doesn't allow for more nuanced consideration of the gendered content of online harassment. Uh, and it might be that uh, the comments that respondents have categorized as targeting personality and uh, appearance, uh, that is those, the individual uh, types of comments, um, they might also be highly gendered in nature so that the gendered nature of online harassment is underestimated in our results. 
uh, at the same time, women might be more readily uh, might more readily attribute comments to their gender than men do, uh, as gender is often perhaps a more salient category for women. Um, so this we cannot know. Uh, we also saw that online behavior partly uh, explains why men are more subject to online harassment than women. Uh, men are more likely to expose themselves online by being more prone to share their opinions publicly, and therefore they re uh, receive more harassment in return. And this means that our results are not necessarily at odds with studies um, showing that there is more online content harassing women. Because while women may be more vulnerable to receiving online harassment, they may actually receive less, partly because they are less active. Uh, uh, sorry, we just, do you still hear us? We've received the message that we've been signed out of Zoom. No, we can still hear you. Okay, well, that's good to know. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's a disturbing message to get in the middle of a presentation. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so um, women might actually receive less because they are less active in online environments uh, and with online behavior that makes them exposed. Uh, and, but, but I mean, we saw that online behavior doesn't fully explain the gender differences. Uh, and, and one explanation, as Adun also uh, mentioned during uh, when explaining our hypothesis, might be that uh, men have more risky online behavior. Not only that they are more prone to express their views, but that they uh, seek out parts of the internet where they are more exposed to harassment. Uh, we don't, we can't capture that in our survey, uh, but other studies do suggest that women are more, sorry, that men are more likely than women to have this sort of risky online behavior. Uh, so that was why men uh, appear to receive more online harassment. Uh, our second hypothesis was that online harassment targeting who people are in terms of group belonging or as individuals uh, is more likely to silence its targets than online harassment uh, directed towards what people think. Uh, and this uh, hypothesis is supported by the data, but mainly among women. Um, so our study can't really answer why uh, online harassment has stronger effects on women than on men, uh, but we have, um, but it's possible to speculate. One possible explanation is that women react uh, more strongly to online harassment because they receive comments of a different kind than men. For instance, we see that the level of aggressiveness in the messages seem to matter more for women than for men. And there are also larger gender differences in the consequences of hateful comments than unpleasant comments, or sorry, as there are larger differences. Um, and we also saw that women receive proportionally more of the types of harassments um, that are considered to be more hurtful. Uh, that is comments directed towards who they are rather than comments directed towards their opinions. And, and as I've mentioned, we don't have a lot much uh, more uh, information about the content of the comments that the respondents have received, um, but there is other, uh, we have other uh, studies suggesting that gender-based harassment against women often takes the form of sexualized scorn uh, combined with threats and or fantasies of violence. And it's, um, I mean, it's easy to imagine that this type of content might be experienced as more frightening, uh, more taxing than for instance, being attacked for uh, the political content of one's argument. So women might react more strongly to men uh, than men to comments with the same level of aggressiveness because they, the content of uh, the comments is somehow more uh, problematic or frightening. Uh, another uh, explanation for this gender difference might be that uh, online harassment might trigger the awareness of vulnerability among women in a way that's less relevant for men. Uh, 
I mean, most women live with the awareness that they are physically weaker to men and that they belong to a group that's been uh, at least historically vulnerable and exposed. Uh, and they might also be very well aware of the harassment that other women are subjected to online and perceive that there's a particular risk to being a woman online. Uh, so, so this might make um, uh, this might entail that women perceive online harassment as more threatening than men do. And this would explain why women react dispro uh, disproportionately stronger than men to more aggressive comments. It would also explain why women react more strongly to group-based online comments. Um, for individuals belonging to groups that might be perceived as exposed, um, online harassment might trigger precisely the awareness of being exposed, of belonging to a vulnerable group, and therefore inciting more fear. Okay, and so the last uh, type of explanation might be uh, that women react more strongly um, because they are more, uh, because they are simply more uh, easily discouraged from expressing their opinions than men. Other studies have uh, shown that women more than men refrain from expressing their opinions to avoid being ridiculed or harassed or to avoid offending or hurting others. They take, does they make other types of considerations than men do when uh, considering whether or not to express their uh, opinions publicly. And the, as I've uh, mentioned also, the awareness of what other women are exposed to online might in itself scare women from expressing uh, their opinions, regardless of whether or not they've experienced severe online harassment themselves. Um, yeah, and so, and as I've kind of emphasized, and which is a, a central point in the literature on hate speech, the silencing effect of kind of merely witnessing experiences of others, uh, others that one identifies with might be stronger for women than men uh, because of this um, awareness of belonging to a vulnerable and exposed group. So uh, we conclude as uh, researchers <laughs> usually do uh, by, by, by arguing that we need more research um, to understand why women and men react differently to online harassment. Um, and we hope and think that the analytical strategy that we've developed um, in this article and in other work uh, that captures both the level of aggressiveness and the content of online harassment, uh, that that can be useful for further um, research. So this is the reference uh, for the article, if anyone's interested in, in going into more detail. Um, this was what we had planned uh, to present, so I'll just stop sharing now. Okay. Thank you very much, it was very insightful. So I would now open the floor for questions, perhaps. Uh, so if you if anyone has any questions please just uh, launch your mic and camera and go ahead do we have any questions well i have a few if i may um well i wanted to ask uh in the very beginning, you mentioned some literature on uh, harassment and said that the results differ very much by uh, depending on how was the data uh, collected. Uh, could you perhaps elaborate a bit on this? Are there what could be driving these differences? It does this, I don't know, is this like social media versus some specific areas of the internet where there is more harassment towards one gender or the other what could be the like the reason for the difference here well uh so the main uh or at least the uh, the difference that i described was between studies 
that uh, analyze online content and these uh, population-based surveys that measure people's subjective experiences. Um, and one, I mean, one interpretation of that difference would be that uh, once women are online or if women are online in the same arenas as men, they are actually more exposed uh, to harassment. But what we find is that women are usually not uh, present online in the same way as men. So they're not actually attending the same arenas in the same way. And that's also why we have this question of whether um, you know, men's risky online behavior can explain uh, this difference that, they, that men uh, to a greater extent than women are present at more at arenas where they are more at risk than women. Uh, but that can still be true. It can still be true that if women are present present at the same arenas, they will be more harassed. So I think that uh, the two types of methodology captures different things. Uh, the analysis of online content captures uh, the gender differences uh, when women and men are studied within the same kind of internet space in a way. Uh, so it doesn't have to be such a, I mean, in a way we present it as a puzzle, <laughs> uh, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, it, it can be, it, it does make sense that those two things can be true at the same time. I see. Also just short that uh, that explanation is uh, uh, supported by our analysis, which show that when we, we, we take account of their uh, online behavior, the gender differences are reduced, suggesting that men are more active uh, online. But our measure of uh, online behavior is limited because it's uh, we measure the, uh, how often they express uh, uh, opinions publicly online. We don't measure uh, which forums they attend or whether they're into gaming or uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, if, I mean, if we had a more fine-grained uh, measure of online behavior, perhaps we... But I mean, we have other research, more recent research, where we uh, have more precise kind of measures of what we could call risky online behavior. I mean, you've found that uh, men are much more present in in what we call debates with the, or aggressive uh, internet debates, for instance, there, there is a clear gender difference. So, I mean, we have a lot of indications from other studies that men are present in internet arenas where they are more exposed uh, to harassment. Very interesting. Um, <clears throat> and in this study, uh, we're mainly asking about social comments in social media or any comments that were online? Any comments that, uh, that were online, yeah. So it's, it's not limited to social media. Or, or the 2016 survey is actually limited to social media, but the 2013 survey is not limited. So it's, uh, yeah, but it is on social media. Hmm. So it might encompass like during gaming or something like that? Yes. OK. Let's see. I see. And there's been research on that, uh, at least a couple of Norwegian studies that I've uh, seen that, that look at exactly gender, um, the gender dimension of online harassment in gaming, where they find a very kind of sexualized uh, jargon or tone in and, and, um, and find that women are within the gaming sphere, definitely uh, targets of, of gender-based harassment. Do we have other questions, perhaps? I think we have one in the chat from Jan Namazur. Uh, I wanted to ask about the age criterion, how significant it is in terms of being target of hate speech. Um, in general, we find that uh, young adults are more exposed to hate speech than older adults. So that's that's the short uh, the short answer. Um, young adults are also young adults are more exposed to hate speech, and young adults and the middle aged are more likely to be uh, perpetrators of hate speech, according to our studies. 
Which is, is, it, is probably also partly explained by online behavior, um, which is related to the to the to what Martin just said about gaming and different arenas. Because obviously, young adults are more active on more arenas online, so they are they are more at risk as well. Mm. And I mean, it, it's uh, probably good here to emphasize that these were population-based surveys, so these were uh, not surveys. Were they targeting internet use? I mean, these are representative uh, studies. So, so we, in the sense, we capture a wide range of of different types of people with with very different uh, online habits. And I, I recall you had some variables there on other group characteristics. Uh, can I ask if you perhaps tried to like see where, if there are differences uh, in hate speech, uh, for example, based on, uh, I don't know, ethnicity or anything else? Yes, we have, um, I don't have the, uh, the numbers from this paper, it's, it's like in this online appendix, but we have done some of this uh, comparing the majority population to um, people of immigrant descent and to LGBT people, and we find uh, clear differences. Uh, so so uh, all the minority groups we have studied uh, are much more exposed to hate speech than the majority population, which is uh, probably not uh, surprising, but uh, yeah. And also, there are also studies of uh, people with disabilities, and they find the same. I see. I think we have another question in the chat. Uh, do you have variables on political views and if it plays any role in this regard? Yes, we find, a, uh, or, or we use uh, the, the, the traditional, uh, we control for political ideology and that's based on this traditional uh, left-right self-placement you're probably familiar with. Um, and we find this U-shaped curve where uh, people on the far left and the far right are more exposed to the online hate than or online harassment than those in the in the middle. So if you hold more uh, extreme view, political viewpoints, you're more likely to be exposed to online harassment. I, I recall some studies that said that usually on the internet it's the people with the like most extreme views that engage in discussions especially heated heated discussions do, do, you, do you also see something like that is the online behavior also sort of u-shaped uh, yeah. regarding the political identity yeah online behavior and political ideology is correlated uh, as you just said and actually i'm, I'm working on a, um, in another in a, in a book chapter i'm working on these days we have this uh, extra sample uh, of or we have over sampled uh, um, uh, people who are uh, active online or uh, active in expressing political viewpoints online and we find uh, much more uh, political polarization among those who are active online compared to, to those who are not. So more people voting for the far right or the far left, more people who are either immigrant skeptic or very immigrant liberal, etc. etc. So we find in general more uh, the more you engage or the more the more you uh, share your uh, political opinions online, the more likely you are to, to be on either the far left or the far right. See, thanks. We have some new uh, questions in the chat. Uh, first is by Anastasia Stavridou. Hi, I joined a bit late, so I didn't hear the first part of the talk. Sorry, apologies if this was explained before. Uh, following up from your previous answer that women tend to be targets of hate speech more often in online games, did you look at how women reacted towards these incidents? Did they accept this kind of harassment or did they reject it? Sorry if this is something outside, outside the scope of your study. Uh, yeah, and, and it is because I was referring to um, uh, some other researchers. We haven't looked at online gaming uh, in itself. So, so our study is more kind of general. Um, and and uh, But it's, a, it's an interesting question. And I'm just trying to think if I can remember their conclusions. I don't... Uh, 
I don't really remember, but they've done some really nice things. Um, uh, Ask is her name. I don't remember the uh, first her first name. Uh, A S K. She's done some really interesting work on on gendered harassment in online gaming and the strategies. Yeah, we have them. Um, we've referenced them in the article uh, in our article, so you can find it in the reference um, in the references. There. Unfortunately, it's written in Norwegian. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's uh, the, the English title is when the girls have to go into the closet: sexual harassment and gender freedom in online gaming. Yeah, so that's, I mean, they looked at strategies that women use in this online game. And then I think this title refers to one of the strategies that I remember, which is to try to conceal your gender to shelter yourself from um, the harassment. But um, what I do remember is, I don't remember exactly more about the women's responses, but uh, interestingly, the men that were interviewed um, didn't necessarily see uh, the comments as problematic because they saw it just as a as a is is jargon uh, an English word? I mean, it was just the way this was the language used in this um, arena. So they didn't they uh, felt that they didn't really mean anything by it. It wasn't uh, they didn't have misogynistic intentions or anything. This was just how this is how we speak. Whereas of course the women uh, did not see it as as equally innocent kind of as the men did, but uh, no, sorry, I can't really <laughs> say anything more about uh, that issue, I think. Thank you. And we have uh, two questions from Sophie Wilkinson. Uh, this is also interesting, thank you. My question is, if we know that men engage in more risky behavior than women, therefore contributing to them getting as much online hate as women. What does the data look like when you discount risky behaviors amongst both men and women? Uh, so uh, there is, um, when we don't take account of uh, online behavior, the, the, the gender differences are larger. So then even more men. So, so the gender differences decrease when we take account of, of online behavior. Uh, and in addition, when did your study take place? I'm sorry if I missed this before. Could it be that in recent years, women have been trolled, seen other women be trolled and learned to hold back on their opinions on the internet? Anecdotally, I know this to be the case. Yeah, so we rely on two, um, two separate surveys, actually. So the, the first one was conducted in 2013, which is now ages ago. And uh, the second one was in 2016. So it's 13 and 16 and that, uh, um, yeah. It's, uh, we, we also did a recent survey in, in 2020, last year, which actually follows up the survey from uh, 13. And uh, the overall picture is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is um, stability in Norway, at least. So the share of the population have been exposed to unpleasant comments or uh, threats are the same uh, now uh, as uh, eight years ago and um, six years ago, yeah. But I mean, it's an interesting point, uh, which also is a point that we're trying to make that this, I think, uh, whether or not there is more trolling of women online, I don't know. Uh, but there is, at least in Norway, definitely more attention to this phenomena. And that's what I was uh, trying to say also, that just the awareness of this risk, I think, has become probably much stronger because you continuously read about women, female politicians, um, other type of high profile women being uh, attacked and, and getting quite serious kind of sexualized and, and other types of very like gender specific hate and harassment. And this awareness will, of course, uh, shape how women interpret the comments that they uh, receive. So, so definitely, that's uh, I think that's important when interpreting our findings. Thank you very much. Uh, so, there's also two thank yous now in the chat, and a comment about uh, whether that it would be curious to see if the Me Too uh, changed something in this regard. 
we need more research. <laughs> <laughs> and more question, funding, more research. <laughs> that's a very, I mean, it's a very good question. And, and I would be in a way surprised if it didn't, because I mean, we, we capture subjective experiences and with the heightened awareness about these issues. Uh, and that was in one way what Me Too was also about, was to uh, provide a language for the types of experiences that women, but also men, perhaps didn't have a proper language for, or that they just, things that were just happening that you were expected to accept, but now with Me Too uh, was articulated into a different type of language, which, which might, I mean, uh, shape how people then would report, that people would report instances differently or experiences differently now after Me Too uh, than before. So that would be, yeah, that would be very interesting. You can also have a hypothesis that uh, there would be that Me Too has a uh, stronger effects in in certain professional groups, uh, in elite groups. I mean, among politicians, journalists, uh, culture workers. I think there are. Uh, uh, so this is it's uh, again important to emphasize that this is a population based surveys. So studies of um, like journalists and politicians tend to show. Lar the, uh, larger uh, gender differences. So female politicians are more exposed to harassment than male politicians. But of course, again, more men are engaged in in kind of or or they expose themselves to more. So they are yeah. So that's probably why we don't see the conventional gender differences when we study the full population. Well, thank you. Uh just maybe the last question from me. Uh, is there like any data that is collected in a consistent manner that would show how <laughs> this evolves over time, even if this is just like one small question in some larger survey that asks about personal experiences? Or is this not yet included anywhere? Well, we, ha we have one survey that has uh, been carried out in three waves. So that's the 2013 survey was uh, repeated in 2015 and in 2020. So that's the, the survey asking about unpleasant comments and uh, it also asks about threats. Uh, so, the, and, and uh, the, the overall uh, picture there is, uh, is uh, stability. But of <laughs> course, and, and, but this is only in Norway, so it would be interesting to see comparative data on, on this as well. So I don't know about comparative data on online harassment. There are a few studies, uh, but typically comparing four countries mm -hmm. or five countries, etc. Yeah. At one point in time, probably. Yeah, at yeah. one point in time, usually. Mm. I see. And of course, there's difficulties with this is that, uh, again, because we are measuring subjective experiences, and of course, just the word hate speech may sound differently in Polish than in Norwegian and in English. So, I mean, people may have different uh, uh, comprehensions of what, what it is. What, but what is hate speech? I mean, it's, it's an unclear concept for most people, probably. Yeah, you're right. I mean, both probably different levels of hate speech and different uh, interpretation of the, whether someone has or, or hasn't experienced this, right? Yes. That would be difficult to compare it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, do we have any other last questions, perhaps? Well, if not, then I would like to thank you again very much for this presentation. Uh, I think it was really insightful. And well, to everyone, well, hopefully we'll see each other in the next seminars. So thank you again. And thank you for having bye. us. <laughs> thank you.